maybe this thing that I'm, I'm struggling with right now is a response to a prayer that I pray. Or maybe. Maybe it's the fruition of God beginning to bring things together in your life. Maybe it's God beginning to catapult you into your destiny. And you think, man, I don't, I don't really want to be going through the stuff that I'm going through. But if you look at it in proper perspective, and you think about what you pray, and you think about where God is going, and God is about to move you beyond your circumstances, beyond your situation, and catapult you into a new elevation, a new destiny in your life. Now, if we think about all this, I know, I, I heard this here a while back. It's, I don't know, whenever, whenever it happened, uh, well, Nick Saban retired. Maybe I didn't even know how long has it been since? He's been like a few months ago. Yeah. A few months ago, Glenda's our, our resident out of the house, man. I'll take no offense this morning. And there may be some others. But a few months ago, Nick Saban retired. And <clears throat> during this time, they were interviewing him, and he had <coughs> went back and Show some clips and some things that, that he said. And I'm not necessarily an Alabama fan. Any Alabama fan besides Glenn and Glenn, you raise your hand. Any Alabama fan, oh, we got a few in here. I'll pray for y'all on the end of the service. I'm I'm messing with y'all. I love y'all. But I'm not necessarily, I don't dislike this thing. I just kind of always been a dog fan. That's kind of how it's going to be. Ain't that right, Rod? There you go. Amen. Rod, you can see on the back row. Amen. So, not that I did like I'm going to say, hey, I don't want to cheer for Alabama as long as they ain't playing the dogs. It don't really, it don't really bother me. If they come down to Alabama playing for a national championship on somebody else and the dogs wasn't involved in it, then, hey, I'll pull for Alabama. But anyway, here's the thing. You begin to think about Nick Saban and some of the things that he said. And, and I, he said something that was really pretty profound. And you might not even like or prefer Alabama Crimson Tide football. You may not even like or prefer Nick Saban, and that's okay. But I think one thing that we can't deny, we cannot deny the greatness of Nick Saban. His ability to win football games. His ability to overcome an overwhelming obstacle, come right from behind, come from the being a, a, a losing in the game, and turn around. You know, it's always said. I can remember time after time, and whoever was playing Alabama, and they would say, oh yeah, they, they, they're going to beat Alabama today. And I said, don't count him out. Because he always had this ability to come from behind. And that's just great coaching. He just had, he was just destined to be great. And I think as we, as we see this, he said one thing that kind of stuck with me. He said, if you want to be great, you don't have many options. And I thought about that. If you want to be great, there's not a there's not an opportunity for greatness on every corner. I really think about greatness. Greatness never goes on sale. Greatness is something you've got to pay full price for. You've got to work at it. You've got to dig into it. You, you can't just sit back and say, I'm going to be great today. Greatness is one of those things that, that if we look at it, it costs what it costs and it takes what it takes. And those who want to be in this great moment, in the, to possess this greatness, must be willing to pay the price for it. Now, I think about greatness. Greatness is one of those things, if you really think about it, greatness is not, it's not necessarily on. Greatness is something that's like it's winning. And you say, what do you mean, Richard? Here's the thing. Greatness is one of those things that you have to, you, you have to pay for it every single day. It's not like something you just go out and you sign up and you do a good deed, but all of a sudden you're great. No, it's a work in progress. It's something every single day that we have to work towards, that we have to pour into, that we have to put into to be great. Nick Saban didn't just wake up every day and say, well, I'm going to be great today. I'm just super smart. And I, I don't have to do anything. I'm just going to sit back and watch greatness just fall out of the sky on me. Not how it happened. Any other coach has ever been great. Didn't happen that way. And I think as we think about Nick Saban's story, we look at his life and <coughs> what he said, I think there's a lot of biblical explanation to this because Jesus said something that was very similar to this. And as we look at what Jesus said, he said he wanted to talk about not only being great on the football field, but Jesus said, I want to look into spiritual greatness. I want to look at what it takes to be spiritually great. From an individual standpoint, 
standpoint, or to a legal standpoint, as a body believer, Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 48. I didn't give y'all that one. But Jesus said, where much is given, much is required. He's given us resources. He has resourced us to be able to be drained. But that requires something. That requires something that he goes on. And I did give y'all this, Greg, and that's our social uh, text for today, Matthew 16, 24. This is what he did say. He said, where much is given, much is required. He said, if a man wants to come after me and want to be one of my disciples, he said, this is what he's got to do. He's got to take up a cross and follow me. Can you imagine when Jesus started picking his disciples and then other people began to follow after him? That you had the original disciple and then you had others that were, that were following after him. They begin to see the miracle. They begin to hear the teaching. And they begin to follow after him. And all of a sudden you just got a, a large number of people that were there for the miracles. That were there for the fish and bread. That were there to watch the dead raised. But they were not. They were spectators in the sport. They were, they were the fans. But they were not going to give anything, sacrifice anything, or put forth any effort. All they were there to see what Jesus was going to do. And Jesus looked down and said this. He said, if you're going to follow after me, then I need you to deny yourself, take up the cross, then follow me. These were the prerequisites of following after Jesus. So Jesus also said, if anyone, this is his kind of ideas, he puts this into perspective here. He said, if anyone wants the elevation of becoming my disciple, if anyone wants to evolve into something greater, then the first thing that's got to happen is you must suppress the inferior want, the inferior desire that's on the inside of you. And as we begin to see this, we look at what Jesus was telling these people. He said, if you want to be my disciple, he said, you can't just be a spectator. He said, you got to get rid of that desire to be a spectator. And he says, and then, as I begin to pour into your life, he said, when you suppress that inferior desire to be a spectator, he said, then you can possess something that is superior and that's being a disciple. Same thing goes to church. If we want to be great individually, if we want to be great as a church, we have got to suppress the, the, the lesser desires, the interior, inferior desire to just come and, and go to church and say, oh yeah, well I've done my part. If we want to be great, we've got to really get into God's Word, pour into God's Word, pray, have a vision, have a desire, have something on the inside of us that says, I want more than what I got. And I think as we begin to look at this, we have to suppress those inter inferior desires. You know, self-denial, that's what he said. Deny yourself. We think about self-denial. It, it's real, on the surface, it's real easy to say, well, I just... I'm just going to desire something different. Self-denial don't mean that you don't want something. It don't mean that you don't want to be a spectator. It don't mean that you don't want some particular area in your ministry or want something. But here's the thing about it. What we've got to understand is when we desire something, we've got to ask God, is this inferior or is this superior? God, is this, is this little or is this big? God, is this what I want or is this what you want, God? And as we begin to dissect that, you know, I want friends. We all want friends. But I like peace of mind sometimes, too. And if you don't have the right friends, you might have peace of mind. If you don't have the right people in your life, you're going to struggle. I want success, but I want my standards to be high. I don't want just a limited amount of success. I want to be able to go above and beyond. I want to be able to do great things, not just mediocre things. And I think as we look at this, this is kind of what God just really imparted into my spirit this morning. And he just said, I want to sit and tell you this. Church, I want more. I want more. Is there anyone out here that wants more this morning? Amen. Amen. A handful. Thank you, Lord, for that handful. Because without this handful, we can't be great. Because the rest of you 
God's best is for us. And as we begin to look at this, for some of you, you're just satisfied. You're satisfied with flat green church just like it stands. And I know that because we see when anything new pops up, oh, no, no, we don't want that. Satisfied just like it is. Let's keep it the same. Let's don't rock the boat. But my prayer this morning, that God will realign your thinking. That God will realign your lesser desires and put them into a superior desire. I pray that God will move however he needs to move with people in position, out of position, whatever positions need to be moved to make this church, the church, the great church that God wants it to be. So if we're thinking way too small, way too small. And this is, this is kind of where Jesus looked at those disciples and said, you just want to be a spectator. You're thinking too small because I've got great things for my disciples to do. I'm entrusting the, the disciples with the gospel of Jesus Christ to turn the world upside down. And I don't need spectators. I need movers and shakers. I need people with a desire in their heart to get out and tell somebody about me. Tell somebody about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said, I don't need spectators. He said, what I need is movers and shakers. If we look at our scripture again, he said, if any man will come after me, he'll follow me, he's got to take up his cross. Jesus articulated something. This, this really got me as I read this this morning. Jesus really, really began to articulate something in, in their mind, but also in my mind this morning about this passage of scripture. What he's articulated about the elevation and the transformation and the and the, and the, the evolution of what he's about to do to this group of disciples, we're honest about this text. If we read this text, we're going to read it one more time. Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. If we're honest about this text, I believe we will conclude that what it teaches us is that evolution, transformation, and elevation only come through adversity. Think about that. What is he saying? He's telling the people there, he said, you want to you be involved into something greater than you are? You want to be elevated? You want to be, you want to be picked up and lifted up? You, you want to be transformed? Then this is how you do it. You take up a cross and you follow me. You find your place, you find your calling, you find your destiny, and you get after it. You get after it is what he's saying. So as we see this, Matthew 16, 24, this is not a scripture that really promotes unity. And, and you know, I'm sure many have heard that message. I'm sure when all of these people begin to follow after Jesus, and Jesus said, oh, if you're going to follow after me, I need you to take up a cross. Follow me. They like, oh, see you, Jesus. Don't be long to do that. Thank you, though. I was just here for the show. But anyway, as we understand that, this was not a, a, a scripture that everybody said, oh, yeah, yeah, we're all in. We're all in, Jesus. Every one of us. Now, we know better than that. We even know his own disciples struggle with that. Because I'm just going to tell you, when they were crucifying him, they wasn't lined up at the foot of the cross saying Jesus is the way. So as we understand that, this is not a scripture that promotes unity. They, they were just casual followers, casual attenders, and they were not prepared for the university of picking up a problem. <clears throat> not at all. And I think this is maybe where I pray from. And God kind of revealed that to me this morning as I was praying and trying to put this together. I, I've really been praying for the last couple, three years for unity. 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 Unify our church. Unify. Make us one mind, one accord. And then God asked me a question. I've been praying, and you know, as I think about this, I said this earlier. The struggles that we have sometimes are a direct result of our own prayers. The struggle I was having was a direct result of what I've been praying for. I had been praying for unity. And the more I pray for unity, the more divided we've got. The more I pray for unity, the more struggle I become. But here's the thing. God asked me this question. He said, do you want unity? Do you want destiny? That's a pretty hard question to answer. But I'll tell you what.
what I might ask the Wally. <clears throat> I'll take destiny over here. I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings, but I'll take destiny over here. He said, my plan is destiny and to achieve destiny. And he says that through that plan, there will be adversity. There will be hard times. But through this adversity, this is what God spoke to me. He said, I will suppress the inferior desires of the church, inferior desires of the, of the people, and move them into a place of superior desire if they will just trust me. So as we think about this, we think about destiny. We think about what God really wants to do. We can be unified, everybody on the same page, doing absolutely nothing and making no mark for the kingdom of God. What will we accomplish? But if we are destined to be the hands and the feet of Jesus, the mouth of Jesus, if we are destined to do that, we're going to make a mark on society whether we're unified or whether we're not. Because here's the thing. There's going to be a group that's going to move forward and there's going to be a group that's going to fall back. But the group that's going to move forward is going to be the hands and the feet of Jesus and that's what we've called me. I think there's a lot of churches in the world today that are unified. Unified in the fact that we all have the same idea. Everybody's unified in the fact that we'll come to church, sit on the pew, sing a few songs, and go to the house. That's the unification of the church today. But the destiny of the church is that we would go forth and make disciples, teaching them in the name of Jesus and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the destiny of the church. So as we understand this, we, got, we really look at this passage of Scripture and we see that it's not a unified passage of Scripture that's calling everybody to just be unified in one area. It's good to be unified in doing the great commandment, but we can't be unified in just being complacent. So I think we're in a season of adversity. And this is kind of, this is kind of how God showed it to me. He said, you can't sacrifice destiny for you. I'm going to say that again. You can't sacrifice destiny for unity. Because if we sacrifice destiny for unity, we'll not accomplish anything. We might as well just come and have a social gathering. We might as well just eat chicken and go home. Because that is not the plan and the purpose that God intended for us. We, we are to be, have a destiny to tell people about Jesus. So as we see this, we're not in a season again. We're in a season of adversity. And if we'll be honest, if we'll be really, really honest with what God desires, we just need to let God be God. And let God do the way He wants to. Because we can move through this season of adversity and into the destiny that God has for us. But we have to move beyond the status quo. We have to move beyond the mediocrity. We have to move beyond the complacency. And, and you know, this is bothering me. This has come up in a deacon's meeting here several months ago. Somebody has said something about our church, and they, they said it this way. They said we were an old church. Now, I don't mean that y'all old people. That don't mean that they look as old. That's just old people there. No, we're all. I don't know about y'all. I don't consider myself old. I mean, I don't know how y'all feel about y'all. I feel like I'm pretty young. Y'all just, you young people might look at him and all be old. But I feel like I'm pretty young, y'all. But I don't think that's what they were meaning. I don't think that they were they were saying they just about old people. I think that they looked at our church and this is a this is what they saw. They saw not age, but they saw all the ideas and precepts. They thought, they looked and they said, well, the way they think is old, the way that they perceive themselves is old, and the way that they, ideas that they have are old. And, you know, I got to thinking about that. I said, you know, some ways that can be good, you know. But the problem is we're not reaching them people. We're not reaching that group of people because they perceive us in a certain way. So I think what we've got to understand is sometimes God wants to do something new. Somehow God wants to, wants to shake the bottle a little bit. He wants to, to move the, the dredge and the settling and the pouring of the wine and make us better people. But as we understand this, Jesus even points this out. And you say, well, preacher, you mentioned to start meddling. Now, I'm just going to give you some scripture. That's what I'm going to do. Because I don't ever want you to think I'm meddling. I'm going to give you some scripture to back up what I just said. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 18 through 24, I can't remember, 22. When we look at this, this is what Jesus said. 
and the disciples of John, let me stop right there, the disciples of John the Baptist and the disciples of the Pharisees, they used to fast. And they come to say of him, why did the disciples of John and why did the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples fast not. Now these are, these are people that are talking to Jesus. They come to Jesus and they look at Jesus and his disciples are his disciples and they're not fasting. They're not doing everything like John's disciples are doing. They're not doing everything like the Pharisees are doing. And all of a sudden they look at this and they say, well, he got to be wrong. So we're going to go ask him. Let's go ask him just why he's, why he's doing things differently. Let's go ask him why he's rocking the boat. So the disciples of John, Simon, Pharisee, used to fast. And then they come to Jesus and they say, what about your disciples? Why don't they fast? Verse 19. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. I don't really have time to unpack all that this morning. That's a whole great sermon for a whole other day. But let me give you the gist of it. What Jesus is saying to them is, listen, they don't necessarily need to fast because they have me with them. They don't need they don't need to fast to be able to get a prayer through the heaven because I'm right here. That's, you know, in essence, that's what Jesus is saying to them. Now, the reason they come to him and ask is because something has, has come up that's different. And they're, they're just a little uneasy about it because it's different. I don't think change is, is you know, dislike for change has is, is just come across in the last few years. I think it's something that's been going on ever since Jesus' day. So as we see this, we begin to look, and he says, why are your disciples not fast? He said, as long as I'm with them, there's no need to fast. Verse chapter 20. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast in those days. So there's going to come a time that I'm going to leave them. And then they will begin to fast. Verse 21. He said, this is, he gives them this analogy. Two analogies he gives them here. He said, no man also sows a piece of new cloth <coughs> onto an old garment, else that new piece that filled it up, taking away the old, and the rent, or the rent, is made work. You ever thought about this? None of you buy any of the holes in them, so nobody packs his holes. Back when I was coming up, ain't nobody wear holy jeans. I remember. I'm gonna pick y'all some of y'all back. Way back. Any any y'all men in here remember tough skins? <laughs> some of y'all old enough to remember tough skins. I I remember them tough skins. I don't remember. Were they a J.C. Penny or Sears and Rose Rose? Six months. Okay. So <laughs> you think about that, and I would wear the knees out of my tough skins because I crawled around on the dirt shooting marbles right here, and I was there. And I'd wear the knees out. My mama, bless her heart, she would put them iron on patches on my knees or my pants. And sometimes this is what's interesting about it. I didn't like the thing. I'd rather me be busted out and have that patch on there. That wasn't cool. So anyway, that thing is starting to come loose. And I sit in school and I pick it up. So eventually, you could get it off of there. She got smart. She sewed them babies on there. <laughs> but you know what happened? That was all good for a little bit. But you wash them things a few times, and that old fabric and that new fabric didn't jive. Those stitches would begin to pull out. You could never patch up anything and make it like it was new. And this is what Jesus is saying. He said, no man sold a piece of new cloth on an old garment, for else the new piece to <coughs> build it up, take it away, and the old is made worse. Because that old was just the stitches where she had stitched it on there made the old fabric more fragile, and it just began to tear apart. And then he goes with another analogy. Let's go to verse 21. 22, I'm sorry. And no man... Put a new wine in the old bottle. Else the new wine that burst the bottle and the wine is filled and the bottle will be marred, but new wine must be put in new bottle. They didn't have, they call them bottles. And we think about bottles. We think about a glass bottle. Now you buy your wine in a bottle or a box, however you choose to buy your wine. But you get it, <clears throat> most, up until recently, a few years ago, most of all wine was put in bottles. Why didn't they just continue on with wine skin? Well, what you got to understand what a wine skin is. A wine skin is an animal hide. And they would soften in this thing where it would be supple and they would stitch it together and it would 
they could put wine in it because what, understand what wine was in it. When they brought this <coughs> wine right out of the jug, that wine will, will continue to expand. Ain't that right, Sister Mark Joe? It'll come out of there. <laughs> so here's the thing. If they put new wine and it has not completely stopped burning into a <coughs> old wine skin that was not supple, it would bust some stitches out of it. Now that's why we don't have wine skins anymore. Somebody come up with a, with a better way and say, we're going to make a bottle to put that wine in because there don't nobody want to go get their wine out of a wine skin. You think about this. Every wedding, we talked about this wedding that came the other day. You think about the wedding that came. Now, if people wanted wine in the wedding, they'd come out with boxes, cases, a bottle of wine. What they had then was wine skin. They coat those things in there. Big wine skin. Big bulky wine skin into the wedding. And this is what Jesus is saying. He said, no man puts new wine into old bottles. No, new wine will burst the bottles when the wine is filled and the bottles will be hard, but the new wine must be put into new bottles. Now, we kind of put this into perspective here. I think we look at this and we see that we are in a, in a, in a season of the first. And we wonder sometimes why we are in this. We wonder sometimes why this happens. And I think if we look at this, this is God's way of saying, I want to do a new thing, but I've got to prepare you for the new thing that I'm about to do. Because if you're not ready for the new thing, it'll be like putting new wine in an old wine skin. It's just going to burst and it's going to run out. It's going to be like putting a, a, new, a, a new patch on an old garment. That won't work because all we're doing is patching up the old. And I, I really think if we look at this and, and understand this perspective, what we really need to take away from this is we got to just answer the question this morning. Will we let God do something new? Will we just be honest with God and say, God, I'm struggling and I'm going through a difficult time and I blame it on the devil and I blame it on a lot of things and I blame it on this person or that person, but in all honesty, God, can I really just open my mind to you and run, understand that maybe, just maybe, this season of adversity is catapulting me into something great. But in order to do that, God, I've got to let you do something new. I've got to be willing, open-minded, not shallow, not closed-minded. I've got to be open-minded to what you want to do in me and in our church. Now, as we think about this, we say, well, what's God going to do? You ever thought about new thoughts, new ideas? Maybe you here this morning, you never gave your life to Christ. A new life. That would be amazing this morning. But I think so many times the adversity we're experiencing just may be designed by God, ordained by God, to propel us from mediocrity, from complacency, and into greatness and the destiny that He's called us to be. I really believe that, church. We cannot sacrifice unity for the destiny of God. Because if we do, we'll never be on God's feet. We'll be a complacent, mediocre people. That's not the intention of God. I don't know where you're at this morning. Maybe you're here and you're just struggling with some things. And maybe you just realize that that struggle is an answer to your prayer. An answer to a prayer that God has designed specifically for you to catapult you beyond the inferior thinking and catapult you into superior thinking. And to let you get rid of those inferior desires, inferior thoughts, and to step into the best that God has for us. You hear you've never given your life to Christ. What a wonderful day. You hear you need new life in Christ Jesus. Today is the day of salvation. Because I want you to understand you're sitting there and this message has probably been more for you, sir, than you for a sinner. But I just want you to understand, if you're here and you don't, you don't have a story, you don't have a story about what God has done in your life. If you look at your life and you say, well, I don't see where God has 
ever done anything in my life. I promise you he has, you've just not seen him. But I pray today that you'll be able to see what God wants to do in your life. And if he is tugging at your heart this morning, and you just got this warm, fuzzy feeling that you can't explain. You got the gender in you, and you don't know exactly what's going on. That's the Holy Spirit knocking on your heart's door this morning. He desires you. He desires a relationship with you. And if you're here this morning, would you give him your life? And let him give you a new life in Christ Jesus. As we look at him in the scripture this morning, we thank him for God. We thank him for what he gives us. And we're going to pray and ask him to bring his provision in our life that all things are now for his honor and glory. Let's pray together. Father oh, God, we thank you that we might be able to come to your house, worship you in spirit and in truth. God, we thank you for each one gathered here today. <coughs> God, there's one of the sound of my voice has never made their election sure. Never surrendered their life to you. Just never come and said, I'm a sinner in need of the Savior. God, would you break down the heart this morning? Would you let them see that need for salvation? Would you draw a mind to you before it's everlasting too late? But God, let them know that you love them this morning. And God, you want to take all the wrongs in their life. And you want to cover them with the blood of Jesus. And you want to justify them through Christ Jesus who was crucified for them. And God, I pray for those that may be in the valley of decision this morning. May be struggling with areas in their life that don't know why. God, may let them realize this morning it just could be. It could be your will, your purpose that's designed to catapult them into a greater area of worship, a greater area of obedience. God, show us the way. We ask these things in Jesus' name. All God's people say, Amen.